This is a micro lecture about computerized adaptive testing. It gives you a first insight into computerized adaptive testing. The example I will use is well known. Suppose that you want to give a school advice after primary education. We know that children are very, very different and they've got many traits. For example, some are very good at mathematics, other go others are good at reading, but the things are not necessarily related. So some people can do one thing, others can do the other, some can do both. The unrelated latent traits need to be measured all. Now there are many and big differences between children in the country and we want to measure this for many, many children. The items we can use are dichotomous and let's assume there is no guessing. So the answers can only be correct and incorrect and you can't guess the correct answer, at least that will be very difficult. Suppose that we want to measure a latent trait. This is a latent trait. It ranges from low to high, it's one dimension. If we want to measure subtle differences, we have to take note that even these small differences on the latent trait, at least if we look at it from this perspective, can be many. So there are many differences between individuals and they're rather subtle. Now, suppose we try to measure the level of a specific latent trait, say the level of mathematical knowledge, with one single item. And suppose that item is almost perfect, because in the remainder of this micro lecture I will use almost perfect items. And the problems that I will identify are, at least, are much bigger than I present here, because we hardly ever use almost perfect items. Now, suppose that we want to measure the level of knowledge, and we've got some item. We pose the question, people with a low latent trait will answer the question incorrectly. Children with a high level of that latent trait will answer the question correctly. So this is the type of answers we will get when we ask a question. In this range, we will find both correct and incorrect answers, while the children have the same latent trait. Here, however, there are almost no observations, and here also there are almost no observations. This is what makes the item almost perfect. Now, the relationship between the latent trait and the item is estimated by a curve like this. Suppose that we want to use one almost perfect item to distinguish between individuals. This is the latent trait, here is the item. And suppose that the item trace line looks like this. Now, of course, we can distinguish between individuals using this specific item. If item 1 is answered incorrectly by a specific individual, then the latent trait is most probably somewhere in this range. Please note, we're dealing with almost perfect items, so the possibility that the person actually has a much higher latent trait is almost absent. If the question is answered correctly, the latent trait of an individual is most probably somewhere in this range. Now, this is a very easy item. A lot of children answer the question correctly. The relative size of both groups depends on the difficulty of the item. In this case, since this is a very simple item, we can only distinguish between a small group of children that do not know a lot about uh, mathematics, for example, and a very large group that knows a bit more. Suppose, again, that we've got one single item, but now we have a slightly more difficult item. The item looks like this. If item 1 is answered incorrectly, the latent trait is most probably somewhere in this range. If item 1 is answered correctly, the latent trait is most probably, probably somewhere in this range. So now we can distinguish between two groups that are almost of an equal size. Assuming that, for example, the latent trait is normally distributed in a population. The overlap depends on the specificity of the item. If the item is very, very specific, there will be hardly any overlap. If the item is not very specific, the overlap will be substantial. Suppose now that we've got two almost perfect items to distinguish between individuals. Now we can say if item 1 is answered incorrectly, the latent trait is most probably somewhere in this range. 
while if item 2 and 1 are answered correctly, the latent trait is most probably somewhere in this range. And the same is true for the intermediate group, those answering 1 correctly but 2 incorrectly. They are probably somewhere here. So if, you, if we have two items, almost perfect items, we can distinguish between more groups of individuals, although there is still a lot of uncertainty. Because if people answer a question correctly, we still do not know exactly where they are on the latent trait. Here is an example with four almost perfect items to distinguish between individuals. And the groups that we can distinguish now on the latent trait on the basis of their answering pattern are presented by the arrows here. There is still overlap, but we can make more subtle distinctions. Now, what's the problem with this idea? First of all, we need many, many, many items to distinguish between respondents. We need that for many latent traits. And the items need to have a known difficulty and a known specificity. Because otherwise, we can't distinguish, we can't use the items in an assessment of individuals. Moreover, items are seldom almost perfect. So we need to take into account the possibility that people answer the question correctly well, they do not know a lot about mathematics or do not have a high score on the latent trait, and do uh, uh, answer the question incorrectly while they're actually scoring very high. There is another problem. Suppose that you do not know a lot about mathematics, say, and you have to answer an awful lot of difficult questions about mathematics that will cause respondent stress and will give you no additional information. At the same time, suppose that you have a high score on that latent trait. Then you have to answer many simple questions that are answered correctly, of course, because you know a lot, but you will get terribly bored and it will give us not a lot of additional information. Now, all these problems together lead to the idea of computerized adaptive testing. The solution is to create a huge item bank and to study the difficulty and specificity of all these items. So we create an item bank that looks like this. This is of course an example with almost perfect items. Now if we want to use such a large uh, item bank, we can start with uh, an item that distinguishes between those that are on the left hand side of the latent trait and those that are on the right-hand side of the latent trait. So an item like this, which is very discriminatory for the whole population. On the basis of this answer, we can now select a second item. Because if the individuals answer the question correctly, they're probably somewhere here. So we should select an item somewhere over there. If they answer the question incorrectly, we should select an item somewhere over there. So suppose that the previous question was answered correctly. This is an item which is very, very discriminatory for this group. It distinguishes the group into two, two almost equally sized groups. So now if the respondent answers this specific question correctly, we can select an item there. If they answer the question incorrectly, we can select the next item here. Now this is called adaptive testing, and it can be done by computers. Computers can be used to select the correct item in order to reduce the number of items given to individuals. Now the explanation I gave here of computer adaptive testing was very deterministic because we dealt with almost perfect items. But computer adaptive testing can also be used for more probabilistic testing, taking into account that people make mistakes and sometimes guess the answer correctly. In this micro lecture, I introduce you shortly to the idea of an item bank with known item difficulties and item specificities and the idea of computerized adaptive testing.